Good morning at Gulesh Programmier nach 21. This is day three of GPN. Um, it's wonderful to see so many of you lovely people out there. This talk is about uh, parameter security. So you know what happens, you, you deploy a new piece of software, you get a new appliance. We have to make it secure. What's the default answer? Let's put it behind the firewall. Why this is maybe not a good idea and even more constructive, what could be useful, useful and uh, practical alternatives is going to be the topic of the next talk. So please welcome with a very warm round of applause, McFly with Perimeter Security is that get over it. Thank you very much for showing up to my talk, which is so early in the day. I actually expected to have five people sitting here um, and everybody else being outside on the sunshine. So thank you for showing up. I uh, give this talk in English because there is uh, two, three people in the audience who doesn't speak German. And more importantly, um, I'd like to have this at a proper recording because in my day life, I get very often asked, what do you think about this topic? And then the easiest way actually would be to say, here, there is a link to media.cccde, please read that. Um, and uh, yeah, I, um, in my living, I live in the Netherlands, I'm German, I've hanged around at the CCC for quite a while, but now I am security advisor uh, uh, at the Port of Rotterdam when it comes to security and software development, so I just became the professional smart ass. Um, I also, or you possibly, most of you over here have more seen me in this environment. Um, I at some point had the weird the idea to start this middleware thing and then that escalated a bit. Um, but that summary was, was that see you on camp all hopefully. That will be nice. Yeah. Um, I do a lot with uh, uh, computers. Um, more on the side on, of security, in the beginning out of interest, then I made it my job and then I turned to become one of those uh, professional smart asses in a company. Um, I'm an NPC in a computer game, so I'm a quest giver where you can go to and that gives you tasks to do so. Um, I like hacker spaces, I've been involved in uh, several of them um, in my past and COVID made me also into a woodworker. Uh, I'm old, I'm 49, I um, started in the whole BBS time, still before this internet, I, on the CBIT, CBIT in 1996, I think, I uh, walked over there, I lived or grew up very close to the CBIT, so as a young person, you clearly got a ticket to go there. I did run people from the Case Computer Club because they had a stand there and that's actually where I signed up and thought, hey, that's cool, uh, I've been in the BBS, um, yeah. I like going to conferences, talk a lot, um, yeah, and in, since 2016 I am living in the Netherlands. My wife is Dutch and at some point we had the, to make the decision of like, do we go to the Netherlands, do I stay in Germany and you live in the Netherlands, that's not very practical. Um, on Mastodon and on Matrix you will find me over there if you want to. Um, yeah, let's come to the motivation of the talk. I have meanwhile spent a while in this uh, whole professional security thing and over the time I've helped build, build, um, reviewed, uh, all penetrating, tested all of the other networks and a lot of them are based on the parameter. That is the solution we are basically doing since a long time. I'll go in this talk over this. Um, over the time uh, we got better with that, um, and we got more complex technology, but it didn't really help. As a security consultant in the Netherlands, so in the Netherlands I worked as a security consultant, um, it was easy to find the date, that's easy to remember. Uh, my company got pwned uh, by NotPetya. Um, from the first indicators of compromise, as that's nicely called then, till all of our Windows systems were gone were eight minutes. Um, to just to give you an impression, that's 45,000 desktop workplaces, roughly. Uh, we thought we had 5,000 servers in the data center, but like, and everything went silent because they switched themselves off. 
Um, and uh, people counted in the data center and we found we had over 9,000 devices in the racks. Um, so, um, yeah, we had a very complex company network uh, uh, and actually a relatively modern broker firewall, intrusion detection systems, all of that stuff. Uh, malware, endpoint security on all of the devices, none of that happened, uh, helped. Um, and that gets you in the thinking of these solutions we are kind of recommending to kind of build are still the right things to do. So, not only technology, typo, and ways of working need to change, um, also Darkman in the ICT needs to change. This talk is about this change. So to go a bit into that, uh, who of you know what parameter and parameter security is? Okay, who does not know? Who thinks they might know but also are not actually sure about that? Okay. <laughs> that also includes me. Um, a parameter is in general the idea of defining an inside and an outside. Um, it applies to the company network where the inside is your company and your network and the outside is uh, um, the world out there. Think as a castles, right? With walls and gates and stuff like that. And if you have a more complicated setup, so if you ever been on really big castles, then you see that they have multiple stacked areas. And so when the enemy gets in, he only gets to the first area, and then there's a second gate, and so on and so on. So castles exist in different complexity systems. Pretty sure you've seen this picture at some point. Um, was a wonder like that. Uh, on the parameter, I try to define um, and my outside network, my inside network, and the gate between it. So where do I draw my line? The thinking of parameter security comes actually from the military. Um, that is kind of the line you consider to be your home base in this say. The larger sense also, uh, the lines you're responsible to defend for. Who of you is over 40? Cool. In the beginning, the computers happened in companies. <laughs> and I write here mainframes, and yes, I'm among nerds. I completely know that this is not a com absolutely correct term. There were lots of other systems that had different names, but let's just categorize all of that stuff into mainframes. I'm pretty sure of you, the ones that know what I mean. Yeah, we can discuss this over a beer, but mainframes. You have a big machine, sits in a room, the room's basically built for it, the whole AC system spills around this. The parameter, so to say, is the room. There were some few elected people that were actually allowed to touch the system, and you're considered to be like your outer areas of your computer, the, the, to be the room. That was not always correct, kind of from the beginning, because you had terminals, uh, you had modems, and you have something that was called X25. Um, which were ways where you could at least in theory connect those uh, systems, but um, modern network routing as it is today was, for most of the cases, not really a thing yet. Think like this, right? So that's very early. This one is possibly a thing that <laughs> some of you uh, <laughs> might get the idea more. So. Um, this were the, basically the first moments where a computer connected to that, to something in the main risks um, were people, were kids actually that just wanted to play chess and thermonuclear war. <laughs> um, a bit after that came the PCs, and with PCs very quickly came Novel Netware. Um, I'm pretty sure some of you have heard this. Who has had this term? Who had, who had to touch something like this in their career? Yeah. Um, the perimeter was basically the building. In the building, you built a LAN area where you connected all the PCs. You had some servers. You had um, print servers were the most common things, and file servers in the beginning. Um, so a perimeter is still the building. Uh, you change that to different technology. You move over to TCP um, because you can then use some more tooling that, tooling that makes it easier. The first times of this web pages showed up. Some people, some companies actually had something like that. 
um, we built something we called intranet applications at that point, um, which are basically applications that run on your local network without necessarily you even having to have internet, but that use internet technology. Um, and suddenly the internet. So the company was started to be connected to a larger greater network that is more and more public, that couldn't be easily accessed. So people, uh, the first thing that came out was then called a firewall. In the beginning, um, you had usually stateless, um, well, there were firewalls for controlling network traffic. Um, and that is the moment where those uh, gates became kind of important. Like uh, when you kind of build a gate in your house that you can go to the outside and you have valuable things in there then you sometimes tend to like put people at the gates and asking people who come in like who are you and what do you want here? Um, as said we built intranet applications so the service became more common um, and at some point the service from the basement of the company that were still like this first one room and then multiple rooms next to each other the data center in the company that moved to a real data center somewhere else completely. We're still connected to the company network, um, but that is the first time where the physical uh, boundaries of the company and the network extension of the parameter actually becomes detached. Uh, we develop lots of funny technology on the way down there, VLAN, so you kind of separate your company network and virtual networks in the hope that when something plays happens in one area that doesn't necessarily swap over directly to the others or you want to restrict access in some way. Um, yeah, Your network within the company gets more complicated and more complicated because you give nerds better tools that have more capabilities. Suddenly you could have more than 16 VLANs, so people very quickly had a lot of them. Uh, all of that is. And then people usually from sales are the first one that say, hey, I'm always a tour at the customer or some service people that you have to send out to the field in a mechanical company. Can I get a VPN access in the company? So suddenly, um, places all over the world where people from your company were working um, became kind of part of the local parameter because those computers typically could still be reached within the network. Um, yeah. We get more intelligent tools um, that got better and better over the different times and actually blocking and as accessing rights, uh, inspecting traffic and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it also becomes more complex. Um, then intranet applications and mail move into the internet and become cloud of applications, Office 365. So we try to set up Office 365 in a way that access to the company services over there are only possible from the company gateway, uh, which also results that I still force everybody to be on the VPN, but I have a cloud solution that can't be accessed from the internet. Right. Um, so this is also ways to, if you have people that have a very strong uh, parameter security thinking, they will then also say, let's access, restrict the access of the Office 365 to just our company gate, but who of you has such a solution in their company? Yeah, I see some hands, right? So, <laughs> um, you know what I'm speaking about. Um, servers in the data center completely moved on the internet. We basically gave up on the internet and gave up on the idea that there is actually physical servers. Uh, there are a lot of companies do this whole idea of it has different names, it's called shift left or uh, uh, so very often it really results and I'm building virtual machines with cloud tooling on AWS so I can still run my Windows systems but also some services really become more modern things like your software developers play around with Kubernetes and with Docker containers and deployment pipelines and all of those stuff. So. All of those areas kind of also become part of the parameter, but also kind of not. Um, everything is very complicated meanwhile. At some point, several parts of your company have uh, services, uh, Azure, some have at AWS, maybe somebody's in the Google Cloud or so in your company. So at some point, the network department just gives up and includes all of the cloud services to be on the parameter. more of your even physical stuff. Like in our company, our printers are physical, but they work over a service that's on the cloud. 
Um, I think quite some people of you have also the solutions. You can build your wireless, that's basically a cloud service that is completely administrated in some way, and they sell it to you, it's become cloud-based, which is, I know, all of you know, BS, but never mind. And then COVID happens, and everybody has to work from home. So we connect all of the people of the company now over the VPN, because we have a VPN anywhere, because of the salespeople. So the perimeter now contains the home networks of the people. And the coffee place where they hang out. Like, I live in the Netherlands, I'm not saying coffee shop here, but um, I think you get the idea. Um, and the co-working places, and the hacker spaces, and the places where they become, become kind of, but kind of not part of your perimeter. Um, and let's just say, it's, if you tell people, can you draw your network and your parameter? Um, that's an interesting example. That's not a session in a medium-sized company that will go over in under two hours. And people will still be discussing some points on this map. Um, that's basically where we are today. Um, and uh, yeah, it comes to the point of uh, problems with parameter security. Um, first of all, um, defining an outside on the inside turns into something that the security ruling on the inside of the system uh, just less tight. So Lara said it in the introduction, we have this thing, the pen test found lots of security issues with that, it's not so bad, it's just on the internal network, right? Who have ever heard something, any variation of this in, in their life? Yeah, I, I thought so. <laughs> I guess that's why you're here. Um, well, and, and in the end, that's the idea of a protected area. Right? When I have a castle in the medieval ages, I wanted to kind of look at the gates so I don't have to look on the inside the whole time. That's the thought behind that. And um, yes, it sounds very, very easy. Like, I have an outside, I have an inside, please draw a line. But it's really, really complicated in the end. And that gets us to some of the problems. First of them, obviously, is malware. Um, I said I, one of the motivations for this was a talk, uh, uh, was an experience I had about a company being completely sunk by a malware attack. Um, it was a parcel shipment company uh, with worldwide offices. Um, and like, if you have parcels in a parcel company that's very, very much like a network system, right? So the depots could buffer parcels from roughly half a day and they had trucks for two days arriving all over the world and people couldn't even talk to each other because all of our internal tool, uh, tooling, tooling was down. Just finding out what the phone numbers of the foreign offices was a pain in the ass. So that's things you actually want to have some backups from. That's, uh, yeah, backup, I saw somebody had a thing saying, can backup can mitlight? Sure, we had a backup. We had a really modern, fancy backup solution that was Windows and cloud-based. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we had at that point also an old backup tape solution, and basically everything that was built before that was still backing up on the tapes. All that was fine, but everything the last three years after the cloud backup solution, the, the cloud backup, the uh, on-premise Windows-based cluster backup solution that we had, everything that was on there was gone. Um, think employee contracts, right? Every one of us had to hand in their contract, like their personal copy, because company didn't have it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> think those things, like there's like just, yeah. If you find my LinkedIn and then look on the time periods and then look in the press after this, quite a lot of that is actually public and shareholder notices and it reads interesting. There's a shareholder notice saying um, we might or might not be able to give an accurate tax declaration by the end of the year. year. Ah, that was true. <laughs> we didn't know if it was accurate. So. Um, the, I have a parameter security, I expect to get that because I clicked forward already by playing around here. Um, I have a company network, everybody is on the same network, typically in RFC 1918 range where at least routing in between is enabled. So every system in this network can, in theory, ignoring firewall and stuff like this, see other th systems. So we can at least say it enables lateral movement because it creates a route between all the different machines that you have in a company network, right? Do you know what I mean by this? 
Okay, I see you nodding. Um, there is a centralized user management. That comes in two ways. One of them is uh, 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 Active Directory and the groups and the people that are domain administrator or stuff like that because they need to do something in the company, like actually administrate things. And the other problem is in large company networks, you roll out your windows typically by building images that you kind of image on the workplaces that all of the pre-installed software is already up to date. Uh, or already on there at least, and all of that gets updated, then the laptop gets put in the hand of the employee. Who has a company system set up that is working somewhere this way? That you roll out the image, these systems with Windows, yeah. Lots of hands. So that very often results in that all of those machines have the same local administrator password that is in an envelope on the wall of the boss of the security. Nobody's supposed to know it, maybe five people in the company de facto know it, but in general that thing is super high protected and most of the even workers that work with the systems don't know the local, the local administrator password. That's the same on all of those machines. Or different groups have different local admin passwords, so different images also. Um, the less tight security of the internal network makes lateral movement by malware easier. Um, that's uh, a point in the direction of we block all the traffic between the VLANs except all the traffic that we need for Windows administration um, and all of the Active Directory ports because if we close them then Active Directory isn't working anymore. Happens to be also the ports that all the malware likes to use. So yes, you have firewalling and strict rules in that, but specifically the ports that malware uses to kind of move along in the network are actually the ports that you have open anyway because you use Windows also to administrate your boxes. So the nice idea that you had of lots of segregated networks that are all separate from each other falls completely apart as soon as you really start to look a bit closer on that. And ransomware exploited, started to exploit this kind of problems on a larger scale around 2015. Uh, we had the real Petya. It was becoming one of the more famous cases of that. Uh, has anyone of you ever seen this picture? Yeah, see, it's easily 15 people in this talk here. Not Petya, it's the thing that kind of nuked the company where I worked in on there, and that's even assassinated. I worked at TNT. Uh, but it also nuked Mask and partially uh, DHL and a lot of other companies. Uh, it was very fast. It had zero days on board, but it was really did. It came in an update of Alpha Tech software, which finance people had to have on their computer when you had employees in the Ukraine. And they uh, exploited the, the whole deployment pipeline, so it was correctly signed. Um, all of those security mechanisms, kind of, even if you had them enabled, were in place. It got into the system. The local administrator process updates the system because that's what they do. And Minicuts in there, then Minicuts is a tool that can extract the password of the running user. I'm simplifying this here now a bit, but that is roughly what it does. So uh, by this point, the attacker is one of the few people in the company that actually do know the, per the password of the local administrator uh, account. Because Minicuts tells you that when you run an update. Um, yeah. That uh, then escalates very quickly, very fa fastly. As you said, in our company, it took eight minutes. So it spread really, really, really fast, fast in the network. And it started basically with a person in the Ukraine who was two time zones ahead of us, I think, got to their work in the morning, switched on their computer, worked in the finance, had an update from the government from the tech software. And that was the first sign that something went wrong when that computer was out. They actually called the help desk and the help desk was routed over a Windows help desk system where the phone services were in integrated. So the call died because the Windows systems from that systems were basically gone. But yeah, we, we VPN in all of the branches. Um, we VPN in a lot of the employees with their laptops. So everybody who was connected to the company network at that point and was running Windows and their system, their system was gone. Uh, within eight minutes. That was impressive. So, I actually was sick at that time and I had uh, a car accident two days before and I woke up in the morning and looked at my phone and had like 25 messages and kind of the, the secretary of our CTO was real dragon, right? Um, and I had a voice call from her asking in the most nicest and politest way I have ever heard her talking <laughs> if there is any chance if I could come to the company at that day. And yeah, that was um, yeah, that was an interesting day. I didn't leave the company for seven days after that. <laughs> um, 
it is very difficult to actually know where your parameter actually goes to. Complexity, um, the parameter got complex, the solutions are complex, our tooling is complex, and complexity enables mistakes. Um, there are so many things in here. Um, who has an Active Directory? How many users do you have? Yes. Do you have more? Do you have more groups or less groups than users? <laughs> Just asking, right? Because the current value is like anyone has more than five times as many groups as users or knows something like that. That's a very common industry value on larger companies because also that kind of is very distributed all over the company. Nobody knows what the groups are doing, but you also can't really look into the logging because there's processes that run once a year. So if you just looked at the last three months, then you don't know if they're used. And it's sometimes really difficult to find that out as soon as the situation has esca uh, escalated. Most of your active installations will be something like 20 to 25 years by now, I guess. And I still, you're still on the first and maybe the second user base. And um, uh, kudos to all of you who are on the face that they would say they have a properly view, reviewed users, uh, user groups. Um, as said, uh, uh, that needs to change. And one of the way out um, that you hear very often and that I would really recommend people to at least consider on there is what's called zero trust. This is a talk of its own. Seriously, I might maybe scratch on some surface over here and some parts, but if you want to really, really think and look into this idea, I strongly recommend you to read up a lot of stuff before you walk into your company and say, we need to re really urgently change our networks. Um, there are some principles in words, like never trust, always verify, implement least privilege and assume breach. That is like so the three core principles. Um, so, for example, never trust um, is based on the point for one of the parts is in there. You don't trust people just because they happen to have a certain IP address, right? Um, you verify user and devices that want to uh, access your data and your resources. Uh, user is relatively sim uh, simple. A device you can verify with, for example, client certificates. Uh, who hasn't looked in that by now, I strongly recommend that. Um, and yeah, you, it is that you don't get access based on the point that you're in a company network. So you treat the whole internal network that you will still have at the moment where you try to get over to a different solution. And you treat that like the internet. Um, Implement least privilege, that is something that we in theory should already do. Um, we in practice don't. Um, that's why I bought the example of the groups in the Active Directory. Because, so, I for example, in the bin I started in the company, I had rights based on the job history of my boss. Because my account was cloned from his. <laughs> Right, so, and that is clearly not least privileged as I have access in the systems where he used to work in the, within the same company before that. And that is very common that when like, you have movers in the company that this doesn't get done in a proper way. Um, you assume breach, um, so plan breaching of the system, have plans what happens when certain systems are down, when the data is gone, how do you recover. Uh, everybody who has had any kind of ISO certification or stuff like that there's lots of things that you possibly can mention. But in general, the main idea of this is plan for the point that somebody breaches your system and have plans what you do when that happens. And when you do that, try to you will find out what the impact of an attack is and you can try to reduce that. Mostly that means decoupling the systems. Uh, segment the network more into an application standpoint and de reduce dependencies. And the biggest dependency will be your Active Directory and parameter security. Uh, application security becomes way more critical as soon as you put the systems really on more on the internet and at least say I want to have this the same approach that I want to have on the internet. You all have heard we are just putting this on the local network because we don't trust it. That's over then. Right? Because that's the idea behind that. But again, that's one talk or likely multiple talks of its own. Uh, you verify users and applications. 
instead of trusting on uh, IPs and maybe then also top of that users. Uh, strong encryption, um, I say because the tool of your choice is in that point very often then a client, cert uh, a client certificate based system um, that together with a user uh, connection of, uh, um, yeah, works actually relatively good. Um, how do we get out there? We have a lot of users in our company that use cloud software only anyway. So you will have, in any case, any one of you who has Office 365 in that company. Yeah, it's a serious amount of people. You will have a lot of people in your company that don't need to be in the company network. They only need access to Office 365. And the only reason why they're on the, your company network is because HR still has a shitty system that where you kind of write your hours. Um, but besides on that, you don't need that. Uh, um, then there's a lot of company software that you in those environments often have. In our company it was Power BI. That was a system that needed to be available. And then we could put basically everybody who's in management and around that topic, but also who, everybody who is secretary or some, of the, some kind of this stuff out of the network. So they didn't need to be on your company network anymore. And that's a nice group of people because that's usually the group of people who knows least about computers. So it's actually the people you actually want to get out of your company network first. So um, possibly uh, you can then think on, this is like a further talks. I heard I'm nearly at 10 minutes and I wanted to enable questions. Uh, this also goes for software development. There is uh, uh, ways, like your software development likes you has something, something CICD anyway, and maybe you're in GitHub or you can GitHub Enterprise. And you will reach very quickly a point where your software developers don't need to be on the company network anymore because they also only work with cloud service. They just have different names. Um, yeah. Um, as said, um, not only technology and ways of work needs to change, also dogmion of the ICT work, that's a Dutch term of the IT world, uh, need to change. Um, and in this case, this is about the dogma of we build a parameter security. This talk was about this change. And um, yeah, I really like the comparison of the parameter security with the castle. Uh, who of you knows a castle that is still used for defense? Like, sorry? Fort Knox. Uh, okay, that is possibly an example I can let go. But the, yeah. the answer was Fort Knox yeah, yeah, the, no, for the stream, for yeah. the recording. Okay, so the answer was Fort Knox, and that is possibly one of the few uh, examples. But nearly all of them are museums. Um, or piles of rubble. It's basically on you to choose which yours is. Um, but yeah, this is the end of the talk. I have six minutes left. So, um, does any one of you have a question? Thank if you. you have a question, and hopefully there are, there will be one or two or three, please raise your hand. I will get the microphone to you. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, you mentioned that you, in the first incident, you have eight minutes time until everything is gone. Yeah. What you uh, you change something, and what you expect is now the time uh, when it comes again. Is no, no, no. one of the parts of the parameter security and part of the problem is that a parameter is actually a requirement for a company-wide malware attack because otherwise there's no routing, there's no direct connections, there's no like users and so on. If the same would happen again today and that user would be on sitting on such a network, his computer would explode. True. But all of the others wouldn't. So it is actually, um, in this part, breaking the uh, lateral movement chain of a malware to express it this way by taking away the network that has a route between all of those computers. And just connect them over the internet where they, over their browser and other tooling, communicate to services where they need to have a client certificate, where they have user and 2FA. You can, because everything is modern software, then you don't need to uh, take your really old shitty system somewhere in the Czech Republic that runs on some old version of some Juniper thingy to still have not so nice encryption, let's put it this way, you can really rely on modern encryption standards. And I would argue that in a lot of cases, this encryption will be better than what you have in your VPN connection. Yes, I think that's the way. Uh, you have to get more time until everything is going down. Yeah, I, I would even argue that of an, un, an attack of this type, um, that's not possible anymore if you don't have a route between the computers. 
um, because it becomes very specific that, uh, to be able to attack that. So you still do a lot of endpoint protection stuff about something that, for example, in our company we use Intunes. That's a common tool from that, that's from Intel. So the, yes, there is still things I could think of, but uh, uh, the time becomes a lot longer because it becomes a lot more difficult for an attacker to actually achieve the same thing. I mean, so you run an update, you have local administrator, just PS, exec, and every IP address you can ping, and you have three quarters of the company network already. And then you can over mini cuts also, you can also extract the passwords of other running processes as local administrator. So you can then use that to possibly get credential of somebody who hopefully might be domain administrator or something like that. Um, yeah, so I got your idea of uh, making the parameter smaller. I mean, we cannot get rid of it completely because there still will be mostly on on premise servers and so on, maybe hybrid cloud, whatever. But um, take it away from the single user, developer, secretary, whatever of your company. What are your thoughts on um, device management and so on? Because they still will interact with like. Um, credentials or data or whatever you do not want gone so Intune is a tool there are several tools where you can still do that where you do a lot of making sure that people install updates that some security requirements are met and so on and so on but uh, uh, this gets at least a bit easier right because their computer explodes, not the whole company network. So the impact is a lot smaller. It's the difference between somebody can't work and the company is basically gone if we're unlucky. The, the generic term would be endpoint management, right, for Intune? Yeah, endpoint management. So it exists in multiple variants from multiple vendors with multiple capabilities. Yeah, hello, thanks for the talk. Um, I was trying to keep this brief. Uh, do systems exist that manage the uh, per user, per device? Um, permissions to resources and things like that. Um, and which ones do, are they? Uh, basically, a lot of the tooling that you can use in your tool chain, like Office, the Azure uh, stuff, for example, everything that's Office 365 and Code Co can do that. Uh, you can restrict access to that to IP addresses, but you can also restrict access to uh, certificates that need to be signed from, that the browser needs to be uh, uh, present, that I can spread via, uh, uh, via Intunes then, for example, or the people get a USB stick in their laptop when they're in the company and you quickly click through with them. So yes, that does exist. Um, the point that comes with this is that you very often start with a new, a new user base and a way less complex system. Um, and it enables it more, so before you always had the need to kind of dig something together in this one group uh, of this is our company employees so everybody who has an account of the companies and you can have that more distributed you don't have to you can still build if you really want to your big one comp company in the work but in most cases that uh, contains that also this whole area is rethought and reset up and um, yeah so um, it is uh, very likely uh, to get your f direct AD server po um, compromised. So from there, this AD server has has a connection to everyone. Yeah. To every. So, what's the way around? The biggest this? problem actually is not your AD server. The biggest problem is users that are domain administrators, because you're pointing all of the boxes over the local administrator stuff. And then you can ex extract passwords of uh, the people running processes on that with mini cuts. And at some point, you have the laptop of the person that runs the company network. That is your local administrator. As said, we have small groups of very, very powerful people in our company. And soon as those are affected and their machines are affected, then um, um, it gets more interesting. So in our case, it, it happened to be that um, very quickly such a machine got uh, used and then we saw all the logins later, three weeks later when we could access the logs again. Um, yeah. Um, thank you for the talk. Uh, if there are already uh, five times uh, more gr um, like access groups in a company than employers, what do you think should be done about it? Is it in any way affordable to 
reduce these groups to the minimum required for sure it's a gigantic process that takes up lots of resources lots of time that doesn't give a direct immediate a benefit to the company and has risk of disturbing operations. So sure, everybody knows how to fix it that works in this environment. Just nobody gets that, pro that, that project approved by uh, uh, the PO, whoever is responsible for that, because for him there is close to zero benefits in there. It takes up tons of resources. Everybody needs to talk to everybody which the groups are for you. You need to go through a lot of configurations to see where groups are actually used. Um, yeah, it should be done. It's just a gigantic project and close to nobody ever does it. This is the only reason why it's not done. I see. And on a more, more personal note, how did you end up as an NPC in a video game? Because it was <laughs> quite curious in the beginning. <laughs> That's a funny discussion that has to do with Millie Ways. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, um, it happens. The game is called Off Grid the Game. Okay, thanks for the talk. Um, you mentioned uh, supply chain attacks, and yes. if I'm looking at uh, even zero trust environments, my blast radius is still um, the entire user base of applications. So yep. what can you do to improve security of your supply chain? There's other to topics in there, and uh, looking at the time, I'll just say yes. There's, it's not that with zero trust, all of your risks are gone. That's not how it works. But one very specific and very impactful and very much for an attacker enabling risk is gone. So it's like it's not that you can stop working and go home then. I'm sorry. <laughs> we still got four minutes, so we still got time for a few questions. Okay. And by the way, one of the interesting parts of that is if you have an AD driven company like this, uh, it says parameter security. A lot of shit on the parameter security also doesn't work anymore. So when the parameter attack in our company uh, started, we had to smash in all gates. Like we had glass gates that open when we put our badge on there that contains our D that was a look up in the Active Directory. And if you're then still enabled to do that, you could actually enter the building. So we actually had to use firefighters like thingies to smack in like gates and those opening glass doors so people could actually physically get to the company. The parking house wasn't working anymore. You have no idea what that means if you have a building where there is 8,000 people living in there. You do not have parking place for all of them. <laughs> Things like this are really, really interesting. Like the story of Facebook, where they needed to break in their own data center because they had locked them out. I totally so much feel with them. All of your switches are configured against the Active Directory. Right? None of that will work anymore. Just when you have an overview of systems in your company and your dependency says anywhere Active Directory, consider that thing fucked when the company-wide malware attack happens to you. Thank you again. Um, did you ever saw in your career or until today um, a medium-sized or large company uh, with a brownfield deployment which moved from the completely parameter security to a zero trust uh, um, point of view? I have at least worked in at least one company where I'm confident that by the end of this year they are in a complete zero trust network architecture without any kind of local network anymore. And I know a lot of companies that have moved a certain way into this direction. Specifically, at some points you have the move, like a lot of people are working with Office 365 anymore, uh, any way. Um, and they kind of, in, in a company, the first sign to actually stop that is actually very often with the network admins. Because they see how much traffic goes from the outside of the company through the VPN, over the connection to the Azure. So it gets into the company network and then out again. That is pretty awesome for your network link that you have. And you really need a bigger network link because everything is uh, too slow and then you start saying, okay. Why don't we allow those people to connect directly? And you will see benefits very quickly in there. So if you get to the point that you just say, I'll just click out everybody. Uh, like I try to identify the internal systems that are used by everybody. Very commonly, HR is your system over there. And then the first thing you need to do is have HR throw a bunch of money onto rewriting their uh, old stinky, smelly software that they have for administrating the users. That is then the first step, because that is the main thing in the companies that I've seen that suddenly enables you to put large amounts of users out of your company network. Well, and that's all the time we had. So please, thank you very much, McFly, and please give him a very warm round of applause. Thanks very much.